I'll Be Waiting by Raymond Chandler At one o'clock in the morning, Carl, the night porter, turned down the last of three table lamps in the main lobby of the Windermere Hotel. The blue carpet darkened a shade or two and the walls drew back into remoteness. The chairs filled with shadowy loungers. In the corners were memories like cobwebs. Tony Resick yawned. He put his head on one side and listened to the frail, twittery music from the radio room behind a dim arch at the far side of the lobby. He frowned. That should be his radio room after 1 a.m. Nobody should be in it. That red-haired girl was spoiling his nights. The frown passed, and a miniature of a smile quirked at the corners of his lips. He sat relaxed, a short, pale, paunchy, middle-aged man with long, delicate fingers clasped on the elk's tooth on his watch chain. The long, delicate fingers of a sleight-of-hand artist, fingers with shiny, molded nails and tapering first joints, joints a little spatulate at the ends. Handsome fingers. Tony Resick rubbed them gently together, and there was peace in his quiet, sea-gray eyes. The frown came back on his face. The music annoyed him. He got up with the curious litheness, all in one piece, without moving his clasped hands from the watch chain. At one moment, he was leaning back relaxed, and the next, he was standing balanced on his feet, perfectly still, so that the movement of rising seemed to be a thing perfectly perceived, an error of vision. He walked with small, polished shoes delicately across the blue carpet and under the arch. The music was louder. It contained the hot, acid blare, the frenetic, jittering runs of a jam session. It was too loud. The red-haired girl sat there and stared silently at the fretted part of the big radio cabinet, as though she could see the band with its fixed, professional grin and the sweat running down its back. She was curled up with her feet under her on a davenport which seemed to contain most of the cushions in the room. She was tucked among them carefully, like a corsage in the florist's tissue paper. She didn't turn her head. She leaned there, one hand in a small fist on her peach-colored knee. She was wearing lounging pajamas of heavy ribbed silk embroidered with black lotus buds. You like Goodman, Miss Cressy? Tony Resick asked. The girl moved her eyes slowly. The light in there was dim, but the violet of her eyes almost hurt. They were large, deep eyes without a trace of thought in them. Her face was classical and without expression. She said nothing. Tony smiled and moved his fingers at his sides, one by one, feeling them move. You like Goodman, Miss Cressy? He repeated gently. Not to cry over, the girl said tonelessly. Tony rocked back on his heels and looked at her eyes, large, deep, empty eyes. Or were they? He reached down and muted the radio. Don't get me wrong, the girl said. Goodman makes money, and a lad that makes legitimate money these days is a lad you have to respect. But this jitterbug music gives me the backdrop of a beer flat. I like something with roses in it. Maybe you like Mozart, Tony said. Go on, kid me, the girl said. I wasn't kidding you, Miss Cressy. I think Mozart was the greatest man that ever lived, and Toscanini is his prophet. I thought you were the house dick. She put her head back on a pillow and stared at him through her lashes. Make me some of that Mozart, she added. It's too late, Tony sighed. You can't get it now. She gave him another long, lucid glance. Got the eye on me, haven't you, Flatfoot? She laughed a little, almost under her breath. What did I do wrong? Tony smiled his toy smile. Nothing, Miss Cressy. Nothing at all. But you need some fresh air. You've been five days in this hotel and you haven't been outdoors. And you have a tower room. She laughed again. Make me a story about it. I'm bored. There was a girl here once who had your suite. She stayed in the hotel a whole week, like you, without going out at all, I mean. She didn't speak to anybody, hardly. What do you think she did then? The girl eyed him gravely. 
she jumped her bill. He put his long, delicate hand out and turned it slowly, fluttering the fingers with an effect almost like a lazy wave breaking. Uh-uh. She sent down for her bill and paid it. Then she told the hop to be back in half an hour for her suitcases. Then she went out on the balcony. The girl leaned forward a little, her eyes still grave, one hand cupping her peach-colored knee. What did you say your name was? Tony Resick. Sounds like a flunky. Yep, Tony said. Polish. Go on, Tony. All the tower suites have private balconies, Miss Cressy. The walls of them are too low for fourteen stories above the street. It was a dark night that night. High clouds. He dropped his hand with a final gesture, a farewell gesture. Nobody saw her jump, but when she hit, it was like a big gun going off. You're making it up, Tony. Her voice was a clean, dry whisper of sound. He smiled his toy smile. His quiet, sea-gray eyes seemed almost to be smoothing the long waves of her hair. Eve Cressy, he said musingly, a name waiting for lights to be in. Waiting for a tall, dark guy that's no good, Tony. You wouldn't care why. I was married to him once. I might be married to him again. You can make a lot of mistakes in just one lifetime. The hand on her knee opened slowly until the fingers were strained back as far as they would go. Then they closed, quickly and tightly, and even in that dim light the knuckles shone like little polished bones. I played him a low trick once. I put him in a bad place without meaning to. You wouldn't care about that either. It's just that I owe him something. He leaned over softly and turned the knob on the radio. A waltz formed itself dimly on the warm air. A tinsel waltz, but a waltz. He turned the volume up. The music gushed from the loudspeaker in a swirl of shadowed melody. Since Vienna died, all waltzes are shadowed. The girl put her hand on one side and hummed three or four bars and stopped with a sudden tightening of her mouth. Eve Cressy, she said. It was in lights once, at a bum nightclub, a dive. They raided it, and the lights went out. He smiled at her, almost mockingly. It was no dive while you were there, Miss Cressy. That's the waltz the orchestra always played when the old porter walked up and down in front of the hotel entrance, all swelled up with his medals on his chest. The last laugh, Emil Jennings. You wouldn't remember that one, Miss Cressy. Spring, beautiful spring, she said. No, I never saw it. He walked three steps away from her and turned. I have to go upstairs and palm doorknobs. I hope I didn't bother you. You ought to go to bed now. It's pretty late. The tinsel waltz stopped and a voice began to talk. The girl spoke through the voice. You really thought something like that? About the balcony? He nodded. I might have, he said softly. I don't anymore. No chance, Tony. Her smile was a dim, lost leaf. Come and talk to me some more. Redheads don't jump, Tony. They hang on and wither. He looked at her gravely for a moment, and then moved away over the carpet. The porter was standing in the archway that led to the main lobby. Tony hadn't looked that way yet, but he knew somebody was there. He always knew, if anybody was close to him. He could hear the grass grow like the donkey and the bluebird. The porter jerked his chin at him urgently. His broad face above the uniform collar looked sweaty and excited. Tony stepped up close to him, and they went together through the arch and out to the middle of the dim lobby. Trouble? Tony said wearily. There's a guy outside to see you, Tony. He won't come in. I'm doing a wipe-off on the plate glass of the doors, and he comes up beside me, the tall guy. Get Tony he says out of the side of his mouth. Tony said, uh-huh, and looked at the porter's pale blue eyes. Who was it? Al, he said to say he was. Tony's face became as expressionless as dough. Okay, he started to move off. The porter caught his sleeve. Listen, Tony, you got any enemies? Tony laughed politely 
his face still like dough. Listen, Tony. The porter held his sleeve tightly. There's a big black car down the block, the other way from the hacks. There's a guy standing beside it with his foot on the running board. This guy that spoke to me, he wears a dark-colored, wrap-around overcoat with a high collar turned up against his ears. His hat's way low. You can't hardly see his face. He says, get Tony, out of the side of his mouth. You ain't got any enemies, have you, Tony? Only the finance company, Tony said. Beat it. He walked slowly and a little stiffly across the blue carpet, up the three shallow steps to the entrance lobby with the three elevators on one side and the desk on the other. Only one elevator was working. Beside the open doors, his arms folded, the night operator stood silent in a neat blue uniform with silver facings. A lean, dark Mexican named Gomez. A new boy, breaking in on the night shift. The other side was the desk, rose marble with the night clerk leaning on it delicately. A small, neat man with a wispy, reddish mustache and cheeks so rosy they looked roughed. He stared at Tony and poked a nail at his mustache. Tony pointed a stiff index finger at him, folded the other three fingers tight to his palm, and flicked his thumb up and down on the stiff finger. The clerk touched the other side of his mustache and looked bored. Tony went on past the closed and darkened newsstand and the side entrance to the drugstore, out to the brass-bound plate-glass doors. He stopped just inside them and took a deep, hard breath. He squared his shoulders, pushed the doors open, and stepped out into the cold, damp night air. The street was dark, silent. The rumble of traffic on Wilshire, two blocks away, had no body, no meaning. To the left were two taxis. Their drivers leaned against a fender, side by side, smoking. Tony walked the other way. The big, dark car was a third of a block from the hotel entrance. Its lights were dimmed, and it was only when he was almost up to it that he heard the gentle sound of its engine turning over. A tall figure detached itself from the body of the car and strolled toward him, both hands in the pockets of the dark overcoat with the high collar. From the man's mouth the cigarette tip glowed faintly, a rusty pearl. They stopped two feet from each other. The tall man said, Hi, Tony. Long time no see. Hello, Al. How's it going? Can't complain. The man started to take his right hand out of his overcoat pocket, then stopped and laughed quietly. I forgot. Guess you don't want to shake hands. That don't mean anything, Tony said. Shaking hands. Monkeys can shake hands. What's on your mind, Al? Still the funny little fat guy, eh, Tony? I guess. Tony winked his eyes tight. His throat felt tight. You like your job back there? It's a job. Al laughed his quiet laugh again. You take it slow, Tony. I'll take it fast. So it's a job and you want to hold it. Okay. There's a girl named Eve Cressy flopping in your quiet hotel. Get her out. Fast. And right now. What's the trouble? The tall man looked up and down the street. A man behind in the car coughed lightly. She's hooked with the wrong number. Nothing against her personal, but she'll lead trouble to you. Get her out, Tony. You got maybe an hour. Sure, Tony said aimlessly, without meaning. Al took his hand out of his pockets and stretched it against Tony's chest. He gave him a light, lazy push. I wouldn't be telling you just for the hell of it, little fat brother. Get her out of there. Okay. Tony said, without any tone in his voice. The man took back his hand and reached for the car door. He opened it and started to slip in like a lean black shadow. Then he stopped and said something to the men in the car and got out again. He came back to where Tony stood silent, his pale eyes catching a little dim light from the street. Listen, Tony, you always kept your nose clean. You're a good brother, Tony. Tony didn't speak. Al leaned toward him, a long, urgent shadow, the high collar almost touching his ears. It's trouble business, Tony. The boys won't like it, but I'm telling you just the same. This Cressy was married to a lad named Johnny Rails. Rails is out of Quinton two, three days, or a week. He did a three-spot for manslaughter. The girl put him there. He ran down an old man one night when he was drunk, and she was with him. He wouldn't stop. She told him to go in and tell it, or else. 
He didn't go in, so the Johns came for him. Tony said, That's too bad. It's kosher, kid. It's my business to know. This Rawls flapped his mouth in stir about how the girl would be waiting for him when he got out, all set to forgive and forget, and he was going straight to her. Tony said, What's he to you? His voice had a dry, stiff crackle like thick paper. Al laughed. The trouble boys want to see him. He ran a table at a spot on the strip and figured out a scheme. He and another guy took the house for fifty grand. The other lad coughed up, but we still need Johnny's twenty-five. The trouble boys don't get paid to forget. Tony looked up and down the dark street. One of the taxi drivers flicked a cigarette stub in a long arc over the top of one of the cabs. Tony watched it fall and spark on the pavement. He listened to the quiet sound of the big car's motor. I don't want any part of it, he said. I'll get her out. Al backed away from him, nodding. Wise, kid. How's Mom these days? Okay, Tony said. Tell her I was asking for her. Asking for her isn't anything, Tony said. Al turned quickly and got into the car. The car curved lazily in the middle of the block and drifted back toward the corner. Its lights went up and sprayed on a wall. It turned a corner and was gone. The lingering smell of its exhaust drifted past Tony's nose. He turned and walked back to the hotel and into it. He went along to the radio room. The radio still muttered, but the girl was gone from the Davenport in front of it. The pressed cushions were hollowed out by her body. Tony reached down and touched them. He thought they were still warm. He turned the radio off and stood there, turning a thumb slowly in front of his body, his hand flat against his stomach. Then he went back through the lobby toward the elevator bank and stood beside a majolica jar of white sand. The clerk fussed behind a pebbled glass screen at one end of the desk. The air was dead. The elevator bank was dark. Tony looked at the indicator of the middle car and saw that it was at fourteen. Gone to bed, he said under his breath. The door of the porter's room beside the elevators opened, and the little Mexican night operator came out in street clothes. He looked at Tony with a quiet, sidewise look out of the eyes the color of dried-out chestnuts. Good night, boss. Yeah, Tony said absently. He took a thin, dappled cigar out of his vest pocket and smelled it. He examined it slowly, turning it around in his neat fingers. There was a small tear along the side. He frowned at that and put the cigar away. There was a distant sound, and the hand on the indicator began to steal around the bronze dial. Light glittered up in the shaft, and the straight line of the car floor dissolved the darkness below. The car stopped, and the doors opened, and Carl came out of it. His eyes caught Tony with a kind of jump, and he walked over to him, his head on one side, a thin shine along his pink upper lip. Listen, Tony. Tony took his arm in a hard, swift hand and turned him. He pushed him quickly, yet somehow casually, down the steps to the dim main lobby and steered him into a corner. He let go of the arm. His throat tightened again, for no reason he could think of. Well, he said darkly, listen to what? The porter reached into a pocket and hauled out a dollar bill. He give me this, he said loosely. His glittering eyes looked past Tony's shoulder at nothing. They winked rapidly. Ice and ginger ale. Don't stall, Tony growled. Guy in 14B, the porter said. Let me smell your breath. The porter leaned toward him obediently. Liquor, Tony said harshly. He give me a drink. Tony looked down at the dollar bill. Nobody's in 14B, not on my list, he said. Yeah, there is. The porter licked his lips, and his eyes opened and shut several times. Tall, dark guy. All right, Tony said crossly. There's a tall, dark guy in 14B, and he gave you a buck and a drink. Then what? Gat under his arm, Carl said, and blinked. Tony smiled, but his eyes had taken on the lifeless glitter of thick ice. You take Miss Cressy up to her room? Carl shook his head. Gomez. Gomez? I saw her go up. Get away from me, Tony said between his teeth, and don't accept any more drinks from the guests. 
He didn't move until Carl had gone back into his cubbyhole by the elevators and shut the door. Then he moved silently up the three steps and stood in front of the desk, looking at the veined rose marble, the onyx pen set, the fresh registration card in its leather frame. He lifted a hand and smacked it down hard on the marble. The clerk popped out from behind the glass screen like a chipmunk coming out of its hole. Tony took a flimsy out of his breast pocket and spread it on the desk. No 14B on this, he said in a bitter voice. The clerk whisked politely at his mustache. So sorry, you must have been out to supper when he checked in. Who? Registered as James Watterson, San Diego. The clerk yawned. Ask for anybody? The clerk stopped in the middle of the yawn and looked at the top of Tony's head. Why, yes. He asked for a swing band. Why? Smart, fast, and funny, Tony said, if you like him that way. He wrote on his flimsy and stuffed it back into his pocket. I'm going upstairs and palm doorknobs. There's four tower rooms you ain't rented yet. Get up on your toes, son. You're slipping. I made out, the clerk drawled and completed his yawn. Hurry back, Pop. I don't know how I'll get through the time. You could shave that pink fuzz off your lip, Tony said, and went across to the elevators. He opened up a dark one and lit the dome light and shot the car up to 14. He darkened it again, stepped out, and closed the doors. This lobby was smaller than any other, except the one immediately below it. It had a single blue panel door on each of the walls, other than the elevator wall. On each door was a gold number, and letter with a gold wreath around it. Tony walked over to 14A and put his ear to the panel. He heard nothing. Eve Cressy might be in bed asleep, or in the bathroom, or out on the balcony, or she might be sitting there in the room, a few feet away from the door, looking at the wall. Well, he wouldn't expect to be able to hear her sit and look at the wall. He went over to 14B and put his ear to that panel. This was different. There was a sound in there. A man coughed. It sounded somehow like a solitary cough. There were no voices. Tony pressed the small nacre button beside the door. Steps came without hurry. A thickened voice spoke through the panel. Tony made no answer, no sound. The thickened voice repeated the question, lightly, maliciously. Tony pressed the bell again. Mr. James Watterson, or San Diego, should now open the door and give forth noise. He didn't. A silence fell beyond that door that was like the silence of a glacier. Once more, Tony put his ear to the wood. Silence, utterly. He got out a master key on a chain and pushed it delicately into the lock of the door. He turned it, pushed the door inward three inches, and withdrew the key. Then he waited. All right, the voice said harshly. Come in and get it. Tony pushed the door wide and stood there, framed against the light from the lobby. The man was tall, black-haired, angular, and white-faced. He held a gun. He held it as though he knew about guns. Step right in, he drawled. Tony went in through the door and pushed it shut with his shoulder. He kept his hands a little out from his sides, the clever fingers curled and slack. He smiled his quiet little smile. Mr. Watterson? And after that what? I'm the house detective here. It slays me. The tall, white-faced, somehow handsome and somehow not handsome man backed slowly into the room. It was a large room with a low balcony around the two sides of it. French doors opened out on the little, private, open-air balcony that each of the tower rooms had. There was a grate set for a log fire behind a paneled screen in front of a cheerful davenport. A tall, misted glass stood on a hotel tray beside a deep, cozy chair. The man backed toward this and stood in front of it. The large, glistening gun drooped and pointed at the floor. It slays me, he said. I'm in the dump an hour and the house copper gives me the bus. Okay, sweetheart, look in the closet and bathroom, but she just left. You didn't see her yet, Tony said. The man's bleached face filled with unexpected lines. His thickened voice edged toward a snarl. Yeah? Who didn't I see yet? A girl named Eve Cressy. 
The man swallowed. He put his gun down on the table beside the tray. He let himself down into the chair backwards, stiffly, like a man with a touch of lumbago. Then he leaned forward and put his hands on his kneecaps and smiled brightly between his teeth. So she got here, huh? I didn't ask about her yet. I'm a careful guy. I didn't ask yet. She's been here five days, Tony said, waiting for you. She hasn't left the hotel a minute. The man's mouth worked a little. His smile had a knowing tilt to it. I got delayed a little up north, he said smoothly. You know how it is, visiting old friends. You seem to know a lot about my business, copper. That's right, Mr. Rails. The man lunged to his feet and his hand snapped at the gun. He stood leaning over, holding it on the table, staring. Dames talk too much, he said, with a muffled sound in his voice as though he held something soft between his teeth to talk through it. Not dames, Mr. Rails. Huh? The gun slithered on the hard wood of the table. Talk it up, copper. My mind reader just quit. Not dames. Guys. Guys with guns. The glacier silence fell between them again. The man straightened his body out slowly. His face was washed clean of expression, but his eyes were haunted. Tony leaned in front of him, a shortish, plump man with a quiet, pale, friendly face and eyes as simple as forest water. They never run out of gas, those boys, Johnny Rail said and licked at his lip. Early and late they work. The old firm never sleeps. You know who they are? Tony said softly. I could maybe give nine guesses, and twelve of them would be right. The trouble, boys, Tony said, and smiled a brittle smile. Where is she? Johnny Rails asked harshly. Right next door to you. The man walked to the wall and left his gun lying on the table. He stood in front of the wall, studying it. He reached up and gripped the grillwork of the balcony railing. When he dropped his hand and turned, his face had lost some of its lines. His eyes had a quieter glint. He moved back to Tony and stood over him. I've got a steak, he said. Eve sent me some dough and I built it up with the touch I made up north. Case dough, what I mean. The trouble boys talk about twenty-five grand, he smiled crookedly. Five C's I can count. I'd have a lot of fun making them believe that, I would. What did you do with it? Tony asked indifferently. I never had it, copper. Leave that lay. I'm the only guy in the world that believes it. It was a little deal that I got suckered on. I'll believe it, Tony said. They don't kill often, but they can be awful tough. Mugs, Tony said with sudden bitter contempt. Guys with guns. Just mugs. Johnny Rails reached for his glass and drained it empty. The ice cubes tinkled softly as he put it down. He picked his gun up, danced it on his palm, then tucked it, nose down, into an inner breast pocket. He stared at the carpet. How come you're telling me this, copper? I thought maybe you'd give her a break. And if I wouldn't? I kind of think you will, Tony said. Johnny Rails nodded quietly. Can I get out of here? You could take the service elevator to the garage. You could rent a car. I can give you a card to the garage, man. You're a funny little guy, Johnny Rails said. Tony took out a worn, ostrich-skin billfold and scribbled on a printed card. Johnny Rails read it and stood holding it, tapping it against a thumbnail. I could take her with me, he said, his eyes narrow. You could take a ride in a basket, too, Tony said. She's been here five days. I told you. She's been spotted. A guy I know called me up and told me to get her out of here. Told me what it was all about. So I'm getting you out instead. They'll love that, Johnny Rails said. They'll send you violets. I'll weep about it on my day off. Johnny Rails turned his hand over and stared at the palm. I could see her, anyway, before I blow. Next door to here, you said? Tony turned on his heel and started for the door. He said over his shoulder, Don't waste a lot of time, handsome. I might change my mind. The man said, almost gently, You might be spotting me right now, for all I know. Tony didn't turn his head. 
that's a chance you'll have to take. He went on to the door and passed out of the room. He shut it, carefully, silently. Looked once at the door of 14A and got into his dark elevator. He rode it down to the linen room floor and got out to remove the basket that held the service elevator open at that floor. The door slid quietly shut. He held it so that it made no noise. Down the corridor, light came from the open door of the housekeeper's office. Tony got back into his elevator and went on down to the lobby. The little clerk was out of sight behind his pebbled glass screen, auditing accounts. Tony went through the main lobby and turned into the radio room. The radio was on again, soft. She was there, curled up on the Davenport again. The speaker hummed to her, a vague sound so low that what it said was as wordless as the murmur of trees. She turned her head slowly and smiled at him. Finished palming doorknobs? I couldn't sleep worth a nickel, so I came down again, okay? He smiled and nodded. He sat down in a green chair and parted the plump brocade arms of it. Sure, Miss Cressy. Waiting is the hardest kind of work, isn't it? I wish you'd talk to that radio. It sounds like a pretzel being bent. Tony fiddled with it, got nothing he liked, set it back where it had been. Beer parlor drunks are all the customers now. She smiled at him again. I don't bother you being here, Miss Cressy? I like it. You're a sweet little guy, Tony. He looked stiffly at the floor, and a ripple touched his spine. He waited for it to go away. It went slowly. Then he sat back, relaxed again, his neat fingers clasped on his elk's tooth. He listened. Not to the radio. To far-off, uncertain things. Menacing things. And perhaps to just the safe whir of wheels going away into a strange night. Nobody's all bad, he said out loud. The girl looked at him lazily. I've met two or three I was wrong on, then. He nodded. Yeah, he admitted judiciously. I guess there's some that are. The girl yawned, and her deep violet eyes half closed. She nestled back into the cushions. Sit there for a while, Tony. Maybe I could nap. Sure, not a thing for me to do. Don't know why they pay me. She slept quickly and with complete stillness, like a child. Tony hardly breathed for ten minutes. He just watched her, his mouth a little open. There was a quiet fascination in his limpid eyes, as if he was looking at an altar. Then he stood up with infinite care and padded away under the arch to the entrance lobby and the desk. He stood at the desk, listening for a little while. He heard a pen rustling out of sight. He went around the corner to the row of house phones in little glass cubby holes. He lifted one and asked the night operator for the garage. It rang three or four times, and then a boyish voice answered. Windermere Hotel, garage speaking. This is Tony Resick, that guy Watterson I gave a card to. You leave? Sure, Tony. Half an hour almost. Is it your charge? Yeah, Tony said. My party. Thanks. Be seeing you. He hung up and scratched his neck. He went back to the desk and slapped a hand on it. The clerk wafted himself around the screen with his greeter's smile in place. It dropped when he saw Tony. Can't a guy catch up on his work, he grumbled. What's the professional rate on 14B? The clerk stared morosely. There's no professional rate in the tower. Make one. The fellow left already. Was there only an hour? Well, well, the clerk said airily. So the personality didn't click tonight. We gotta skip out? Will five bucks satisfy you? Friend of yours? No, just a drunk with delusions of grandeur and no dough. I guess we'll have to let it ride, Tony. How'd he get out? I took him down the service elevator. You was asleep. Will five bucks satisfy you? Why? The worn, ostrich-skin wallet came out, and a weedy five slipped across the marble. All I could shake him for. Tony said loosely. The clerk took the five and looked puzzled. You're the boss, he said and shrugged. The phone shrilled on the desk, and he reached for it. He listened. 
and then pushed it toward Tony. For you. Tony took the phone and cuddled it close to his chest. He put his mouth close to the transmitter. The voice was strange to him. It had a metallic sound. Its syllables were meticulously anonymous. Tony? Tony Resick? Talking. A message from Al. Shoot. Tony looked at the clerk. Be a pal, he said over the mouthpiece. The clerk flicked a narrow smile at him and went away. Shoot, Tony said into the phone. We had a little business with a guy in your place. Picked him up scamming. Al had a hunch you'd run him out. Tailed him and took him to the curb. Not so good. Backfire. Tony held the phone very tight, and his temples chilled with the evaporation of moisture. Go on, he said. I guess there's more. A little. The guy stopped the big one. Cold. Al. Al said to tell you goodbye. Tony leaned hard against the desk. His mouth made a sound that was not speech. Get it? The metallic voice sounded impatient, a little bored. This guy had him a rod. He used it. Al won't be phoning anybody anymore. Tony lurched at the phone, and the base of it shook on the rose marble. His mouth was a hard, dry knot. The voice said, That's as far as we go, hub. Good night. The phone clicked dryly, like a pebble hitting a wall. Tony put the phone down in its cradle very carefully so as not to make any sound. He looked at the clenched palm of his left hand. He took a handkerchief out and rubbed the palm softly and straightened the fingers out with his other hand. Then he wiped his forehead. The clerk came around the screen again and looked at him with glinting eyes. I'm off Friday. How about lending me that phone number? Tony nodded at the clerk and smiled a minute, fragile, frail smile. He put his handkerchief away and, and patted the pocket he had put it in. He turned and walked away from the desk, across the entrance lobby, down the three shallow steps along the shadowy reaches of the main lobby, and so in through the arch to the radio room once more. He walked softly, like a man moving in a room where somebody is very sick. He reached the chair he had sat in before and lowered himself into it, inch by inch. The girl slept on, motionless, in that curled-up looseness achieved by some women and all cats. Her breath made no slightest sound against the vague murmur of the radio. Tony Resick leaned back in the chair and clasped his hands on his elk's tooth and quietly closed his eyes. <laughs>